Hello, my name is Lauren Sergi, and this is Talk Shop, the place where you can learn from industry experts how to become a stronger communicator in work and in life. If you've ever found the narrative around high performance, the way that we talk about success, about winning, about focus, about driving towards our goals, a bit on the intimidating side, or maybe even a bit on the unrealistic side, today will be an eye-opening conversation for you. Today, we are being joined by Ken Karpoff to talk about how our narratives, the way that we discuss concepts like high performance, could actually be negatively impacting our abilities to reach our goals. Ken Karpoff is a high performance coach to some of the best athletes in the world. He's worked with hundreds of elite performers to improve their mental edge in sport, including national champions, world champions, and Olympic gold medalists. A competitor himself in biathlon at the 1988 Olympics, Ken understands the intense mental pressures faced by elite competitors, and he's used this knowledge to create a unique framework to help businesses, organizations, and entrepreneurs develop their own mental game for high performance. Ken is the author of Head Games, Lessons Learned on the Road to the Olympics. Ken, welcome to Talk Shop. I, I'm very pleased that you're here with us today because why don't you describe a little bit of what you're going through right now. And just for a point of reference, everyone, we are recording this during the uh, Pyeongchang Olympics. So Ken, what's going on with you right now? Well, two hours from now, it's my last competition with the crew yep and in when the next four runs are done i'm done that's it for me no more <laughs> that done yeah. demasiado mucho okay <laughs> so it's kind of that that light at the end of the the stressful stressful tunnel right now oh baby who baby on <laughs> well can can you are a performance coach for the best of the best in athletics, Olympians, world champions, elite, world-class competitors. Now, you also work, though, with world-class business performers, teams, and organizations. So what would you say is the number one similarity between high performance at the Olympics and high performance in the boardroom? That's a tough one because, you know, the boardroom is a very specific environment. And, um, I look at, uh, you know, business performance, you know, it's, it's, it's structured differently. Mm -hmm. so it, you know, it's not a direct, to me, it's not a direct comparison. When I go work with businesses at board meetings, it's, it, it, it's highly different. And it's very individualistic to where a company is, where board is at a particular time. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, there's a very structured way that you go through a sporting event over, especially Olympics as a four year cycle. So year one has a particular play, year two, year three, pre-Olympic year is a particular play, and then year four is very particular. And it's all predictable. With boards and companies, it depends where they are in their business cycle. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say, and, and some companies are stretching, they're trying to find new markets and, they're dealing with competitive situations, and uh, we talk a little bit about the nature of the German situation. And I was in a, a meeting, a, a, a board meeting, a setup board meeting for one company, a tech company, and they were having issues with their sales force dealing with German tactics. Mm -hmm. It depends where you are, what you're doing, because it, it, everything's individual and it's time specific. So. Right. Well, and that's, and that's so interesting to hear because in our, in popular business language and entrepreneurship language, there's always these constant comparisons with athletes, you know, prepare like an athlete, think like an athlete, compete like an athlete. It's not the same thing. And you know it from both sides. Um, you know, that's what I would call a reductum ad excretum. <laughs> shit. <laughs> okay, you cannot do that to be accurate. And what a lot of proponents are saying here, they're trying to, to come up with something that's a chewy little moment of bullshit uh, that means nothing, okay? Because every time you're doing a coaching situation, you walk into it, I 
prepare in the sense that I'm preparing for anything. And mm -hmm. I have to come in open because I walk into a coaching situation with a company or with an arts group or with uh, an athletic team or an athlete, and I never know what I'm going to hit. I'll, I'll give you an example. I walk into breakfast on the day that the bobsleigh team, the day before they left, it was a Friday before Saturday travel, and Shay Smith, one of the super athletes in this country, just a genius, comes up to me and goes, Ken, where have you been? And I'm going, okay, what did that mean? Yeah. Okay. And what did that mean? And what is he telling me? Because he was animated. And Shay Smith is the smoothest, coolest, most urbane athlete I've met in a long time. Super intelligent, but just smooth. Mm -hmm. he was animated. And he was basically saying, we could have used you around more this winter. Okay, and you weren't there, right? I don't travel with the team, so um, <laughs> what, what can I tell you? But it told me a lot just because it told me a lot about the state of the team leaving to go to Korea. Okay, so that little incident informed me how I would work them through the day with the guys that I was working with mm -hmm. and, and the stresses they were going to, and it's specific to that day. If we move it down the road five days, it's different. Right. And to say it's the same on Friday as it would have been like Wednesday when they got to Korea. No, it's not. Different things. Have, and and the same thing with a business situation. You're dealing with a board meeting and then you're moving down the road to another meeting five days hence. I can't tell you, I can't put it into a boilerplate. Yeah. But it is with coaching is, you can, you can do a rational, reductive approach to coaching, either a business or an athlete. And it doesn't work. I work from an intuitive basis. And so can I block it into, say, something that's like a business school blueprint from an MBA program? And I can't do that. Everything changes. And the dynamics of situation is huge in, in working with a business or working with athletes, and it changes like in an instant. It can change. It can change those dynamics so 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 fast. And you know, an area where I think some of some of where we're missing the nuance is this notion of context. You know, we can't. We need to disassociate the language that we use to speak about performance from these like you said, these bon mots, uh, this, these broad global contexts where it sounds really good, but in the end means absolutely nothing and take into consideration the words that we should be using to refer to this specific moment with this group of people at this point in time. It's, we're, it's what different. We're, what we're dealing with in terms of the language set is we're trying to reduce language to a thing. So we're talking about a, a dynamic situation that changes and we use a word that sets it up as not um, a process or an activity or that changes over time as a thing. Yeah. And it tends to be then result focused. So you take a word and it, and it takes you to the end of the process, but it doesn't take you through the process. And it doesn't give you any structure to get there. Mm -hmm. And ultimately when you do that, it skews the meaning to the point where it is opposite of what you need to do which is a convoluted way of saying that when you take and you reduce something to a word and uh, uh, a nostrum, as we do in especially business speak, mm -hmm. it, it takes us to the wrong place and a wrong conclusion. And so it traps people and then they, they try and do it and they're frustrated. They, okay, I'm trying to do X, Y, Z and I can't do it. And what's wrong with me? Yeah. It's wrong with the construction. And um, in previous conversations, we've talked about a few things that, a few hang-ups in terms of language. And we talked about, like, one of your pet peeves is balance. <sighs> ah! Okay? <laughs> it just, like, right into the heart, you hear. And that's something that really seems to be thrown at women entrepreneurs and women business people. You need to achieve balance. Okay, well, let's think about balance. Okay, from from Ken's perspective, is, help me, Ken. 
Okay, so <laughs> you got it. You you got, you're wearing flats, right? You're wearing flats. Yep. You stand up and you you balance on one leg. Okay, so you take your heel and you put it on your toe. Mm -hmm. So your heel's up in the air and you're balancing on one leg. Perfect balance, right? Yeah. For an hour. For an hour. What What do you learn from that hour in balance? One, well, it, first, first thing, <laughs> it's exhausting, right? You're going to fall down. It hurts like hell. It hurts like hell. And two, you're bored blind. Okay? <laughs> the other thing is, Okay, somebody rings the doorbell, your child calls, you yep. can't move. You're in perfect balance. You cannot physically move. You can't go A to B, right? So balance as a notion is bogus. Okay, walking is a series of sequentially imbalanced positions. Yeah. You take a step, and when you take a step, you're falling forward. You catch yourself with your other foot. Your, your trailing foot. That foot, then you go up and you fall and you catch yourself with the other foot. It's a series of imbalanced movements. But if you are perfectly imbalanced, you cannot physically move. Mm -hmm. So the notion of balance as a notion is bogus because you're not looking to be balanced. You're looking to either control the degree that you are imbalanced and the second thing that you'd be looking for is energetic control because when you're really working as a as a female entrepreneur or as a male entrepreneur you're dealing with energy going out and you're getting tired mm -hmm. and you need to rebuild your energy so you have to have energetic control or you have issues that's an entirely different discussion now what balance does is it takes you away from the discussion you need to have is how do you control the degree of imbalance without ever getting into a balanced position, which is static? And how do you control your energy so that you can keep moving? That's right. It's a different discussion. It's a totally different worldview. Okay. And in our present overarching high performance narrative, we don't talk a lot about energetic control. We talk about things like, oh, achieve balance, like magic fairy dust. And yeah. it's just, it's nonsense because. You don't want balance. So balance then becomes what I call mental malware. And it does two big things. It, it's First of all, it's false, so it stops your discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I keep balance. Great. Check mark. Check mark. Done, right? Then it, it's misdirection malware because since it's wrong, it takes you away from what you really need to do. And in this case, you need to work with Controlling the level of imbalance strategically and tactically. And then yeah. you need to be able to control your energy. Okay? Because if you're a female entrepreneur, usually you have kids, the little ones, kid, husband, and and then you've got all this other stuff going around. So you're getting balanced. You need a lot of energetic control. Yes. Which is, you know, it is not in our high-performance narrative. It's, we don't discuss this. How do you do energetic control? Mm -hmm. do your, if you don't do it, you're too exhausted. And if yes. you're looking to balance, as an entrepreneur, you're going crazy because it's something, when you think about it, it's, okay, first of all, it's not achievable. And it's also, you don't want it. No, no. And that's, that's very true. The times where I've created things that I'm most proud of or have been most productive has been in periods where I'm completely out of balance with other areas of my life because I'm hyper-focused on one thing, just yes. one thing. Yes. One of my mentors um, built an oil company from scratch, and I, he's a golf fanatic, just <laughs> golf fanatic. And I asked him once, is, is I, 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 on the question of balance, I just mm -hmm. said, how many years when you're building your company were you not able to play golf? He goes, 13. <laughs> okay, that's what we talk about, entrepreneurial balance. 13 years, golf fanatic, never touched a club yeah. to build this company. The idea that you can do balance and build a company is, that's daft. And trying to then achieve balance as a female entrepreneur, trying to build a company, 
you, you'll go crazy. You'll just go mental. And, yeah. and that's, it's just part of the, the bumpkinism that we've put into the dialogue and the language we put in that just kills us. It really, it really is. And that, that language is pernicious. You know, that was one of the reasons why I was so keen to get you on this show and talk about our narratives surrounding high performance. I'd love to touch more on the mental malware topic yeah. that you've got. It's a, it's a good one. Um, let's talk a little bit about winning. We lionize it. We lionize winning and success. And there's this person is a winner and this person is a winner, but for a totally different reason. You know, it almost like we want to have the big success story, but we also try to be democratic in terms of who gets identified as winners. What is happening to, to the winners themselves or to the people who maybe were just runners up or who almost won but didn't quite make it? What is this narrative doing to us mentally? Okay, I, I'd like to come at it just from a little bit different tack. Okay, we, we, oh, please. We're up, the winner and loser thing is a dichotomy. It's either win, lose, dichotomy, yeah. out, up, down, back, forth. Okay, so it's just you have a point and a point, and it's between the line. But the problem with the narrative is we've set it up with a win or a loss. So you're either a winner or you're a loser, which mm -hmm. is not good. Okay, to me, there's five points of inflection on the scale, right? There's for me, there's a big win when you yep. win huge. There's a win. Then there's a not win. Then there's losing. And then there's cracking on the spectrum. If you win big, usually you're setting yourself up to lose. Okay. Typically, because you're in the winning position, it, it causes you to become really stupid. You win big. And then you think you're great. And then you go down. Now, we did that in 213 with the bobsleigh team. We won five of eight World Cups, won the most points ever in a two-man overall title. And then the driver came to me in 215 after a disastrous 214 and said, we won in 213 to set up to lose in 214. Yes, we did. Okay? Win big usually puts you next time into the lose position. Mm -hmm. Win is a, a much easier position to work with going forward because you can you can work it so you can kind of stay up at a at a high performance level typically usually you don't go dumb and then crash so you and need that kind of that second level to keep driving towards another another target to hit well sometimes you know you have a winning you, you go in winning and you hold it you try to hold that position and then you have the not winning position which is where you get the most growth from okay so when your team is in the not win position like we were last year at the World Championships, where we came in second overall, it was a perfect position for, for the Canadian bobsleigh team because they needed to go up to this level, okay? The German team came across at this level because they were, mm -hmm. and they came together in the two-man race, and guess what? Dead heat, tie. Both teams won gold medal. But they were, one came from the win, position last year the other came from the not win position they met at the same place at the top of the olympic podium depends where you're at where you're moving to but saying it you're a winner or a loser or saying last year we had a troll go after jesse lumps and saying well you didn't win a silver medal you lost a gold medal i'm just going i mean the level of stupid that yeah. is is incredibly powerfully stupid but there's five points. And, and the other thing is we don't look at in a losing position, you have a hit to the head. And then it takes a lot of work to come back from that. So anyways, then the worst position is, of course, if you have an athlete who cracks. So yeah. when we, we, after 214, because we went like this, boom, and the teams crashed. For team one broke, team two broke down, team three broke down sequentially. And the task in, in 214 for me as a coach was, to have a team in a position where you're not going to win anything because the team's done. Mm -hmm. you don't want them to slide into the crack position because then they're damaged. They're finished. So when you talk about winning and losing, it, it, it's too trite because you have these five points of inflection on winning and losing. It's not a dichotomy at all. And our dialogue says you're a winner or you're a loser. The problem with the dialogue is that the most powerful position in go-forward terms is the not-win position. 
That's where you learn the most, where you grow the most. So if you're a parent with children, it's when they've had a, a bump on the road and they've gotten, if they haven't passed or they've been kicked off a team or they didn't make it. Now, Michael Jordan, by the way, was cut from his high school basketball team. Okay? It caused them to go. Right? A little bit higher, a little bit higher. I'm, I'm Reach way higher. higher. Just, just a little. Right? Way higher. So the power position from a teaching perspective, a growth perspective, is when you've not made it, when you're, you're not there. But it, it's nuance again. It's where are you, what do you need to do, where do you need to go? And there's often times when you're better not to win, to set up to win down the road. Right. And you know, Ken, I can see a direct correlation there between a lot of the dialogue that goes on, a lot of the conversation that you see in many of the online entrepreneurial groups, like you get on Facebook or wherever, these online entrepreneurial groups, where you see the vaulted hundred, the six figure launch, you're going to launch this product or this service, and you're going to get six figures out of it. And then when people don't achieve that, they assume there's something wrong with them or wrong with their business or, you know, many people get really discouraged. They mm -hmm. give up altogether. And the nuance that's missing there is, okay, so maybe it didn't hit the 100000 or maybe someone did hit that $100,000 launch, but what were their costs? What was the time sink? What was everything else that went into it? What is behind that number? And I would think that, you know, a better goal to reach would be a more modest number. So I didn't hit the 100K, that's uh, the 100K. That's fine because I kept my costs low. My margin was really high. And I right. did this without sacrificing every other iota in my life. There was another factor that came out. Uh, I just saw a piece today uh, that in terms of launch, in terms of uh, launch mixed with social media, mm -hmm. is that it was, in 216, it was easier to hit a home run than in 217. So we have to realize as we move down temporally through time, these ideas that you can launch and do 100K, it's getting more and more difficult. Yeah. And you're, what we're going to get into very quickly is that you're not going to get an instant launch on a product. You're going to have to fight very long term to build brand and name over a 10 year period, not just one. It's going to take you a decade mm -hmm. to build a product, or it's going to take you like two, three years. Now, people were able to come out of the gate 10 years ago and yes. start a product, and it would rock. The window, okay, it's getting longer to get to the same point just because of the nature of the business environment. And it's changing within every month so that you're setting yourself up for a head break saying, I'm using 216 numbers in 218, and I'm going to achieve a 216 goal in a 218 scenario. Yeah. That's nuts. Like you said at the beginning of this interview, the circumstances are totally different. You can't have the same approach. You cannot. And the other thing about it is each individual pursuit of performance, when each athlete goes to the Olympics, they get hit by a different set of circumstances. Circumstances also don't usually come in one. Okay? They come in sets. I call them waves, sets of waves, like you surf. So as an entrepreneur, in any performance scenario, you have to surf the waves that hit you, the waves of circumstance. If you fail to do that, you're crushed on the rocks. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things is people think, okay, if I do X, Y, Z, I'll be successful. The answer to that is good luck, okay? Circumstances are going to bounce you around, and usually you get hammered hard where you think you're dead mm -hmm. just before you're good, you, you, you come through. And the number of companies that I've, I've seen over the last decade are, or two decades that have come. Okay, one company I was talking to the executive this week. They came within a, a one week window of, of a billion dollar IPO. They were out one week. One week. It personally cost them $100 million. Oh. Okay, an entrepreneur. Okay. Yep. One week out on the window, you're dead. Okay, end of story. It has to line up the stars. 
circumstances have to line up really almost perfectly to hit the big home run. So and when we go back to winning, you drop from, okay, I was going to be a big winner. I'm going to have $100 million. Now I'm out, and you're in a lose. You're going from a not-win position to lose position. And there, if you think about it too hard, you go to a crack position, and your brain shatters, and you're finished. Yeah. One way, right? Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurial casualties because the headset's not there and the expectations there. The metrics are crap. And, oh, you're going to be a winner, you're going to be a winner, you're going to be a winner. No, not true. <laughs> if you look at restaurants, typically one-star chefs or, or Michelin-starred people have had three failures. Or they've been in the woods for like five to ten years before mm -hmm. they got traction. Okay. It's the idea, okay, with entrepreneurs, we're going to be big right now. I think that window has closed or yeah. is closed. And what if you're not prepared to play a long game now, you're, you're kidding yourself. It's Let's talk for a moment about the notion, about the term high performance as well. Yeah. Because that's one that seems to be tossed around very casually. It's super casual and it's yeah. dangerous. So what is true high performance and why is it dangerous to use that term casually? Well, because if you're going to have high performance, you have to be highly imbalanced. Mm -hmm. And you, you burn so much energy that you're extremely fragile. We don't do anything to set people up so that they can ride this through. Right. Winner or loser. Oh, you lost your Michelin star, you're a loser. Well, you can still cook, can't you? Yeah. But that doesn't play in the head plays in the head that I'm a loser and I'm done. Yeah. And, then it, it, and it's insanity, but we set up the heads so that heads are fragile. And by using high performance, like we're going to be do peak performance. I think about it. when you've really done something and created something huge, you've gone to a very imbalanced position. You've dumped a ton of energy into it and you finish it and you're tired. Yes. Okay. You're tired. Yeah. And your family's cranky too. Okay. Let's not forget that part. Okay. People, because you're glued on to doing the thing. So you've got family issues, you're physically exhausted, you've got no energy, and you have to recover. Yeah. No, you cannot do peak imbalance forever. You have to ratchet that back. So, you know, you have a series of performance pops but they have to be met with energy recovery and headspace. Your head has to come down. Mm -hmm. So we're people saying, bang, 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 stay there, stay there, peak, peak, peak all the time. That's completely nuts. Yeah. And we're having casualties, a lot of casualties. And the idea that you're going to do peak performance, like it's one of the big toxic nonsenses in our narrative, like the, the high performance narrative. We're going to have high performance all the time. Yeah. The other part of this is that you have to consider the nature of performance. Do you want to have a peak, unbalanced place where you wipe yourself out? Or do you want to be working in the middle zones of performance where it's a steady state and you can roll it over a 30-year career? You can surf the waves. Yeah, and you have to have, you know, you're going to have ups and downs in terms of energy and in terms of how much stress you have but you're working in the center part where it's a 30-year, a no problem. You can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Performance is like you go boom, and then if you keep going boom, you're dead. Yeah. You're, you're done. The idea that you're going to be at a high level of peak performance, no, you have to come back down. And, yeah. and the thing, too, is if you've seen any of my blogs about preparation is you have preparation to a big event. You come up, 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 up like this, and then you have to stop, rest, and put what I call an interregnum in there. Mm -hmm. Have an energy bill before the performance. Most people don't do that. Mm -hmm. okay? They think you can prep and you can grind right to the big, and there's nothing in the tank, then you can't do the performance because your energy tank is drained. Right. So there's, there's this whole series of things that are critical for high performance if you're going to do at the top level. Like with the guys at the Olympics, the crew going in, I think, were overdone. They were overcooked, and the nervous systems are um, 
fragile. Mm -hmm. So I'm not expecting a medal out of the crew tonight. I think they were cooked. And they were over pushed past where they needed to rest. And so that they're, they're low in the energy tank. So I'm looking at like sixth place. Now, I could be wrong. They could still sneak one out. But yeah, it's very difficult to get the big performance unless you have a full energy tank. And, and the other thing, too, about this is an Olympic cycle. You've got one, two year, years, one, two, and three, and then the Olympic year four. Year three, you push hard, train the hardest. In year four, the shift goes from technical and physical preparation to an energy build. If you don't have energy in the tank, it doesn't matter how fit you are, yeah. you can't drive a performance. You need gas in the tank to drive the car. Car can be a supercar, no gas, no go. Right. right. You can be a super entrepreneur. You got no energy gas, you're done. That's it. I don't care, I don't care who you are. <laughs> so do you have, Ken, do you have any recommendations in terms of changing our narrative? And like this is, and this is pulling back to the business world, the entrepreneurial world. Any recommendations for changing the way we talk about performance that we can get out of this habit of, of lionizing impossibly high performance of using high performance as one of our favorite terms to indicate success or this thing we want to achieve and want to embody what what other narratives could we use well the first of all we have to get a little sophisticated in our narrative and sophisticated means we have to get out of uh, uh saying things like success is a thing yeah okay um or winning is winning and it's losing. It's a dichotomy. You're a success or you're not a success. Well, that's not true. Because winning is not two points. It's, it's at least five points. And it depends where you're at on the scale of those positions after, after an event. Am I in a big win? Am I in a win, not win, lose, or crack position? Because that determines your go forward. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm a winner and I stay a winner. It's winners usually become losers immediately after they've won. Right. And they've got to work back into the win. You're not always at the win position. And the notion that you're a winner or you're a loser, and then you add a, a moral connotation to that, is nuts. Yes, it is. Okay, so you're a high performer or you're a lazy bum. Okay, moral connotation. If I work hard, I'm moral. If I don't work hard, I'm immoral. Yeah. I'm a winner, I'm moral. If I'm a loser, I'm definitely a schmuck and immoral. Crazy, idiotic, simplistic bumpkinism. And uh, our, our high performance narrative is just one toxic swamp of, of bogus ball moths and, you know, nostrums that are just completely nuts. Mm -hmm. So, What's happening is when I'm working with, with performers, meaning entrepreneurs, or they're completely frustrated by the narrative that they're dealing with. It keeps coming at them and coming at them. And I'm finding more and more and more when I'm working with people, it's a simple, can we take the mental mauler out? Can we shift over to here and calm down? Mm -hmm. And then from that point, we start to build a structure in the head, in a headset structure, to get us to a mindset that's functional, that allows you to roll with, I'm in a win position, I'm in a not win position, I'm in this position. So you can come back and you can play long. Mm -hmm. Because we do have a thing called a life, and it's not just like we won this year, right? And it's, I, I know it's boring. It's, I'm not a winner this year, but I might be next year, right? Like, you know, and that's that's a great lesson to take forward, actually, just realize that it's not always this constant, it's not always this constant state of winning and performing and doing everything right and being 100% focused or 100% balanced. It's these things will ebb and flow. And once we can start getting that into our narrative and discussing those as a real part of our life, like you said, it'll help us calm down. And then surf that wave, surf the up and down, and be able to roll with it. And with that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ken. One more point. Uh, just, just to wrap up. Uh, yeah. What we're at is the thing is, if, 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 you, if you, you come at it from a di dichotomy, winner or loser, you, you put yourself in a position where you have no nuance or sophistication in how you go forward. 
Mm -hmm. If you not win situation, you have to realize you're in a really powerful position if you use it to move to this level. And if you're in a big win situation, you have to be scared to death because almost always you go down to lose position. Yeah. So you think, I'm a great winner. I've won bigger than anybody. In a coaching scenario, that makes me the most nervous mm -hmm. of any. Okay? You're the biggest winner. You're the biggest winner of all time. And that usually, in my experience, 100% of the time leads to off a cliff and down. Right. The thing is, the idea that winning is a good thing, okay, it can be a good thing, but winning at a, can be a dangerous thing. Yes. You're looking going forward, and that's never considered. Never considered. Oh, you won. It's obviously good. Ooh, but it's, from my perspective, obviously dangerous. Yeah. It's, you know, it's such, it's such an interesting area in which you work, Ken. Uh, now, if people want to see more of what it is you're doing, first up, check out Head Games. This is a really interesting book. I've been through it a couple times, and there's so many parallels into multiple areas of life that you can apply Ken's knowledge and the lessons that he has drawn from years of working with the elites with the top performers in the world and some of the very heavy lessons that can be learned of that. Now, people, you need to get this book. Ken, where can they get this book? Where can they find more of you so that you can come in and help them out in their own organizations? For the book, uh, Amazon.com, uh, Amazon.ca. Perfect. It's and up there. Go to my website, KenCarpoff.com, and get into the resource section. So I'm building out a series of blogs and blogs that cover off a lot of these topics. But what I do with coaching is we start with the basics of the book to set up the head and to look at the parameters of performance, what is not included in the dialogue mm -hmm. in our narrative. And our narrative is missing some huge components that we need to put in place to be uh, confident with with higher levels of performance. Plus, as you know, in the book, there's a lot of circumstances that, that warn people, be careful what you wish for. Right? <laughs> there's a downside to high performance. Yeah. In that book, I mean, okay, I've been through this for years, and boy, have I seen a lot of casualties from people who have won. And winning yeah. is a safe place, guys. It really, be careful, be careful there. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great note to end on for, especially for the people who watch this program. I know that for many people who love watching this, who like listening to information like this, usually what we're doing is trying to boost our performance. So be mindful, everyone. Be mindful of what you're reaching for. Manage that energy and be very aware of the different circumstances that they're in. So, of course, I will provide links to Ken's book as well as his website in the show notes down below. Now, if you have found this episode, episode useful if it's given you some food for thought for managing your own energy and your own performance please give it a thumbs up subscribe to this channel and then head on over to laurensergi.com and make sure you sign up for the newsletter you'll get these interviews more information from me from people like ken lots of great resources that i only share with my email subscribers Thank you so much for being part of Talk Shop today, Ken. I, I always look forward to our conversations and to our interactions. And to everyone who's watching and listening, thanks for hanging out with us today. I look forward to seeing you again on the next Talk Shop. Bye-bye.